Well, good afternoon. We've been talking about autonomy all day, and we're all very excited about it. And one of the big questions, one that I asked yesterday, is when's it going to happen? When are we going to get these vehicles on the road? Well, uh, you may not really think about this, but it's quite likely to happen in trucks and fleet vehicles first. One of the big questions is whether autonomous vehicles will be privately owned or owned in fleets. And the panel is going to talk about that and some of the ways that these vehicles will uh, get on the road autonomously before anything else. And I think that's really exciting. Um, Daniela, why don't we start with you? Uh, talk a little bit about uh, platooning. About platooning. So what, what is it and why is it happening very quickly? So I think most of you will probably know that it's um, piling up like um, trucks in a row. We do it um, at Mercedes uh, with three trucks in a row. And we showed it one and a half years ago um, on German highways, on public roads. But um, what is important to point out that usually when people talk about platoons, they see there's the first platoon where there's still a driver driving the platoon and the other two drivers in the trucks following are just like resting. But in fact, um, the one we showed was that all trucks were driving autonomously. And the ones behind get a lot of uh, a benefit in terms of fuel economy and all that because there's less air resistance. And they're all, three of them are moving very closely together. It's very interesting to see. Yeah. Joelle, let's move to you. Uh, your company is looking at getting Wi-Fi and connectivity into cars. And you asked me, why do cars need to be connected? Uh, you asked me to ask you that, so I'm <laughs> asking you that. Well, there are many why, reasons why, why, why they need to be connected. It's obviously, it's crucial for the uh, autonomous car. Yeah, well, Daniela gave the, the primary example initially, so the trucks need to talk with each other to be able to coordinate each other into a convoy and basically do platooning, but that's just step one. So uh, they're talking all the time, the They're vehicle sending talks. signals to each other all the time and adapting, you know, the controls. Uh, but uh, once you have not just trucks, but also cars, buses, and vans talking with each other, they can actually build a mesh network uh, that can do several things. Uh, one is it can uh, actually provide internet access as uh, Wi-Fi hotspots. Uh, number two, it can improve a lot the mobility services uh, by sharing tons and tons of data about the vehicles and about the roads and about the traffic and so on. Increase safety because now they can detect each other and not crash into each other. <laughs> and uh, the third aspect is that you can use the vehicles as mobile sensors to gather urban data for smart city applications. And this is critical for autonomy. Uh, on the simplest level, I see it as the car is moving along and it's saying, oh, look, there's a car, there's a person. But you can also have the other car saying, here I am, here I am. Exactly. And that seems to make a lot more sense to ensure that they don't yeah, otherwise, accidentally. otherwise you have to do all of that with video processing, which is very cumbersome in terms of uh, how much pr processing the vehicle has to do and also consumes a lot of energy. But the point for autonomous vehicles is that they actually are artificial intelligence machines that are very data hungry and need to constantly be learning and processing. Mm -hmm. And you have to move this data between them and between uh, the vehicles and the cloud. And that's what Venium is solving. And you've got, you're doing this now. You're doing it uh, into vehicles yeah. now. We built the largest mesh network of connected vehicles in the world, actually here in uh, Portugal, in uh, Porto, up north, uh, where we have the buses, garbage collection trucks, uh, also some <laughs> diamond <laughs> trucks as well, uh, talking with each other on a daily basis. And we have similar networks now in Singapore, New York, and Arbor, Michigan. Wow. Yuki, let's move to you. You've got some uh, video to show what you do, but it's essentially a uh, modular vehicle, and I, I know you see it as having fleet applications, but it could be either a truck or a car, or it could be made into different things. And it's also designed to have a longer shelf life because it can be updated as opposed to just replaced. Yeah, correct. Um, we are a B2B company and we are providing this ready-to-use technology. We are now focusing mainly in the category of compact vehicles for urban usage uh, mainly. Uh, so we are quite complementary to all the other truck, uh, trucks uh, provider and uh, buses provider. 
but um, the peculiar uh, aspect of our uh, offer is that we are uh, applying to the mechanical parts, to the hardware and software as well, and exterior and interior budget, the extreme modularity, because we really believe that uh, vehicles uh, design and engineer for uh, mobility as a service, they need to last as long as possible. So, uh, because the heavy usage during the businesses, when the businesses are and services are very uh, successful, so the operation of the vehicles are very long, potentially 24 hours a day, uh, they really need uh, vehicles that are designed and engineered for this. So, modularity enable repairability, upgradability, replaceability of uh, the hardware and uh, uh, the interior and well, exterior. Well, let's see budget. your video before yeah. we move on. Introducing the future of the automotive industry, a ready-to-use road-legal vehicle designed and engineered in Italy, featuring a platform that is entirely modular, allowing vehicles to adapt to any situation, any location, any need. A truly adaptable vehicle designed and engineered for services. The modular platform allows for truly future-proofed vehicles ready to easily repair, refurbish, and upgrade any part necessary, with flexibility to choose even up to level five complete autonomous driving. A fleet of self-driving, truly white label <laughs> vehicles can operate up to 24 hours every day, allowing for maximum efficiency. And because the entire platform is built on a modular architecture, fleets of vehicles can last 10 times longer, customizable, modular, and upgradable, designed to last, designed to evolve. Daniela, let's stay on this theme of the use case of these vehicles in autonomous drive. And because you've mentioned to me that trucks are only used, we all know here probably that, tr that cars are only used 5% of the time. 95% of the time they're sitting idle. But trucks, we normally think that they're on the road all the time, but you told me they're only used like 35% of the time. Yeah, actually, I was quite surprised by these numbers as well, well because with trucks, we are in B2B business, and you would guess like 80% of the time they are driving, but in fact, they are not. So it's only 35% of driving, and even worse, of the trucks that they are driving, it's one of four trucks in Europe is driving empty, meaning not only fully loaded, but completely yeah. empty. So that means we have to bring the utilization of trucks and the load of trucks, we have to bring it up to get away from traffic jams and what we see out there. So That's presumably in an autonomous world, you wouldn't have the issue. As you mentioned, generally there's one driver and one truck and the driver has to sleep, so that the car's That's sitting true. idle yes. then. Yeah. An autonomous car can be pretty much working 24 seven. So we might need something like Yuki's vehicles that are designed for a long shelf life. I noticed here in Lisbon, that the, a lot of the Uber cars are on the road 24 seven. So in a year or something, they ac acquire something like 200,000 kilometers. It's amazing. But do you think in the autonomous world, we'll have much higher utilization of our trucks and fleet vehicles? Yeah, we would, we would definitely have. Because currently, the main point is that there's a one-on-one -on -one relationship between the driver and the truck. And it means when the driver has to sleep, the truck has to stay. Yeah, and if it's an autonomous truck, it can drive like, as you said, 24 by seven. That's uh, the idea. And the thing is that when mobility of people and goods becomes a non-demand service, uh, the logic changes completely. I mean, even yeah. for people, it, I, I believe it's gonna be a lot more like air travel. Like today, yes. I enter a plane, I want to arrive on time, I want to arrive safely, I want a comfortable seat, great entertainment system, and I want to be connected all the time. Right. But I don't care if it's Boeing or Airbus, I don't care so much how the airplane looks from the outside, I want this experience. Yeah. And so the vehicles at the end of the day are going to be carrying people at peak times, carrying goods at off-peak times, and then the next question is, what can the vehicles be? beyond machines that carry people and goods back and forth. And that's where data and connectivity plays an enormous role because it enables us to use the vehicles as part of the infrastructure uh, and 
imagine you have a football game and you need to increase the network capacity for 40,000 people. Just send 20 autonomous vehicles, they mesh with each other and they increase the internet capacity. Or there's an incident uh, with a terrorist uh, in downtown. Uh, law enforcement needs more visibility. Send 10 autonomous vehicles, they have cameras, and you can in, uh, increase the visibility in that area. When you start thinking of vehicles as part of the city infrastructure, uh, and, and uh, as part of the wireless and the smart city ecosystem, there's a million different use cases that uh, uh, appear, and I do believe that it's going to be a very, very different type of mobility system that well, is going to do a lot we of heard in one of the earlier panels just now that the windows on the car can become screens, so yeah. you, could, you could look at your Facebook or play a game on the actual windscreen because you're not, uh, you don't need to look out it anymore. So Yuki, I would ask you, uh, are you, are you planning for that kind of future? Are you a reimagining of what the interior of the car might be, this place that'll become somewhere we can play and work yeah. and uh, have more free time? Yeah, definitely, because uh, as Intel says, Actually, in the future, there will be no cars anymore, but supercomputers on wheels. So really, yep. the <laughs> connectivity, computing power, sensors are super key <laughs> <laughs> features. And uh, uh, that's why, actually, as we are providing white label technologies and solutions to services, we really believe that uh, through the modularity, we enable also our customers to choo choose which kind of uh, uh, features in, in integrate in the in the vehicle. So uh, vehicle that, uh, that that's your customizable. Exactly. Aspect, right? Yeah, and uh, it, this is also very important because uh, being neutral, you can uh, really also allow uh, countries, governments, and uh, customers, companies to select which kind of AI, for example, to use. Uh, w uh, how to also define the ownership or manage the data that they are collecting, all these supercomputers on wheels, and uh, not having a, only one solution or not letting also some certain companies to dominate the world, but providing a neutral solution is really important now because vehicles really are not going to be cars anymore, but really collector of data. Well, <laughs> let me ask you all, e any of you can jump in on this, but. Are we going to see the end of private car ownership? Is that going to happen very quickly? Let's ask Daimler. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think, I think it would be a welcome my outcome. My private opinion really. or my official one? <laughs> uh, no, but actually, we, we, we started the first steps into that direction. So we have car to go So it's a car sharing service already, where we see ourselves as a whole company not being tied to we are a car manufacturer and stick to that as our core business, but really want well, to develop. Well, let me just interrupt you, Danielle. Is that hard for a car maker, which has had, I mean, Daimler's like the oldest car maker there is. It's been selling people cars for well over 100 yeah. years. Is it hard to change that model to think of it maybe as a mobility service, not a, not a selling service? Well, we, we can do a quick poll. So, <laughs> so how many of you own a car? How many of you own a car? That's right. And how many of you can imagine not owning a car? <laughs> so there you are. <laughs> it's, if you ran this poll like five years ago, you probably wouldn't have anyone raising their hand. Yeah, well, people can imagine a lot of things they still <laughs> hesitate to do. So, uh, well, but well, they don't want they actually to, want to do don't, it. They don't want to get away with mobility, yeah? <laughs> they still, as long yeah, you want mobility, and we have to offer services, yeah. even though we might, might not sell that many cars, but we yeah. sell mobility, so and that is the idea. And, and here's the thing, I, you know, I think the main, the main culprit for this is actually this little device, the smartphone, oh, because yeah. I bet you people prefer to be online than to be driving. And when, when you ask people, and it's like, people will drive for pleasure. I think they, will, they might even buy a, a Daimler car and go in Mercedes and uh, just for pleasure, but nobody takes pleasure in being in a traffic jam at 8 a.m. I don't know anyone who likes that. And I, and also from uh, an environmental sustainability uh, point of view, if you think about climate change and all the difficulties that we are going to face in the next few years, how can we live you know, with having millions and millions and millions of metal boxes that are just standing out there in the parking lot for hours? I mean, the average vehicle utilization is 5%. Mm -hmm. So trucks at least is 35%. <laughs> but the average <laughs> private vehicle is like 5%. I don't think that we as a society or, or we as, a, as the people can actually uh, live with, with this situation any longer. And so I welcome well, well, on let, demand. Let's just look at this idea of utilization. If we could reduce 
if we could get our cars used a whole, a whole lot more, we need a lot less cars, but we probably need a lot less parking for them. Because if they're used constantly, they don't have to be sitting 95% of, of the time. Exactly. So there are scenarios that imagine that we can take all this parking that takes like, you know, in some places 30% or 40% of our cities and use that for something else. Plants, Suddenly trees, part of the playgrounds, do <laughs> back you know, to human uses oxygen. for this stuff. <laughs> no, absolutely. And I think it's a moral imperative uh, at a time where, uh, you know, I think we have the obligation to leave to our children a better planet than we found it. And yeah. I think this is part of the solution. I mean, trans well, people always say that, but we have to actually do it. Well, Vice President Al Gore just before <laughs> in the roundtable was, tell was telling us that already, you know, uh, transportation accounts for more emissions now than the power plants. Uh, so, so this has changed. Uh, and so working in transportation, I think we, we do have uh, an obligation uh, to be able to provide uh, the same quality or even a better quality of mobility service with less vehicles in a much more efficient way. Uh, and utilization is one point, but I think also the, the whole overall experience mm -hmm. is, is very important, both for goods and also for, for, for yes. people transport, and, and that's what we're working on. So do we all agree that the future of cars is probably in fleets? And uh, uh, if you talk to somebody like Bob Lutz, a big American auto executive, he thinks that brands are gonna go away. Because as you mentioned earlier, uh, Joao, that the, uh, the, the caring about what your car is when you're really only involved with the interior of it, yeah. you're not driving it, is, is not gonna be all that important. So uh, brands could go away. Your car is more like a, a, a train car than it is like an automobile today. So uh, it's really a different, um, a totally different environment we're no, likely to be in. But actually, I wouldn't get that far, <laughs> <laughs> for sure not. I think that's clear, but um, the question is, what is the premium that we currently have built in the car and the hardware? So what is the superior user experience in future and how can we develop that? I think that is yeah. the main question. So perhaps not the hardware yeah. that, that creates the USP, um, but what really, the convenience, the service, uh, the intermodality, whatever you feel um, yeah. and data, can it, be it. Yeah. It has well, to be y very Yuki, simple. let me ask you this because I don't think automakers have had to think a whole lot about how their cars are gonna be used in recent years because they're all used the same way, basically, or the same basic way. But you have to think that your cars might be used very differently than they've been used in the past. So that probably goes into your thinking about how you design them, how you market them, all that stuff. But this usage uh, is clear that, um, okay, it's, we are shifting to mobility as a service very uh, fast because, for example, Intel and strategy analytics in their report, they uh, predict the seven trillion dollar market in 2050. So definitely numbers are, th are talking very clearly. The thing is that, uh, as uh, Joao was saying, uh, it will be much more important the experience in mobility. So I think that automakers like uh, Auto OEM right now and new players that will uh, enter into the industry, they need to focus on uh, uh, enhancing uh, on this On the experience. other hand, your car yeah. was designed in Italy and it does look pretty good. They're pretty, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we like aesthetics. <laughs> well, we're just about out of time. I want to yeah. thank you three. It was a very lively panel. Uh, Daniela, Joao, and uh, Yuki, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you so much. Thank you.